our scripture reading today, let us turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. My son, keep your father's command, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Find them always on your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. Let us bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come together today to worship you. Father, we know that Throughout the week, we experience your blessings continually in our life, so much that we can't even count them. And this morning, we have come to worship together uh, and praise you for the many things that you have done for us. Father, we thank you for the earthly fathers that you have blessed us with. And we just pray that as we go through the service today, that we would just... Um, Think of our fathers and honor them today uh, in, in some way about it. We thank you, Father, again for the truth of your word that we just read. We're so thankful that when we have uh, your word fit in our hearts, uh, it will be a blessing to our lives. It will supply us with the wisdom we need. Father, we're thankful that Skip and Sharon can be with us today to and share your word with us. And we just pray that you would just be in our midst today as we worship you and hear your word. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. songs here we're going to do this morning, but, but before we do that, we have a birthday in our church. That young man running that camera back there, have a birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.
us in the hymn, but we'll do the first and second verses. Number 306.
seated. It's good to see Pastor Skip and Charm. And I'd like you all to take notice that Charm hasn't had age of single. <laughs>
he's not going to fight. And so, so Sennacherib uh, uh, puts a tribute on him. So he has to pay all this money to, to the king of Syria. Or, uh, Syria. And so uh, that went on for probably 10, maybe 12 years that they were under, under, under the Assyrians. Well, then uh, Hezekiah kind of rebelled a bit. And he kind of thought, well, maybe, you know, they, we wouldn't have to continue to do this. And, of course, that uh, was not what uh, Sennacherib wanted to hear. And so he comes with 185,000 soldiers. And he comes down and he says, okay. And so he marches through Judah, he gets that to, to, to Jerusalem. And he surrounds Jerusalem. And, and, and when you read the story, if you have the opportunity today, uh, first, or Second Kings chapters 18 and 19, Isaiah chapters 36 to 37, he mocks the God of, of, of Israel. He says, do you really think your God can, can help you? Do you really think your God can help you fight against me? You know, and, and, and so uh, Hezekiah has to make a choice at that point. Is he going to surrender? Is he going to say, okay, you're, you're too big, you know, I, there, and, uh, or, or is he going to stand firm? And it's really interesting because the Necrop sends a letter that he wants uh, 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 Hezekiah to surrender, give in. And, and so when Hezekiah gets that letter, he goes to Isaiah, who was the prophet at the time, and he says to Isaiah, what shall I do? And, and there in, 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 the, in the, the, the passage, it says, he goes into the house of God. He goes into the temple. He goes in, and he lays the letter before the Lord, and he says, Lord, what am I going to do? And God, and through Isaiah, the, the, the answer comes, will you trust me? Will you believe that I'll take care of you? Hezekiah makes the right choice. He decides that he's going to trust God. And God does a miracle. And literally in one night, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are killed. When they wake up the next morning, all around Jerusalem, everyone's dead. And, and Sennacherib, what can he do? And so he marches away, he leaves Jerusalem, and Judah is saved. All because, again, Hezekiah was willing to trust God with an impossible situation that was far beyond anything he could ever have done on his own. So Necker, he thought he had Hezekiah caught in a trap like a bird. But Hezekiah prays. God speaks, and the enemy is defeated completely. This psalm has three affirmations for our lives. What's shaking in your life? What mountain are you facing? What sea is roaring in your life? What seems impossible? What seems like, uh, I don't know how you're going to do this. I have no idea how in the world this is ever going to work out. It could be a health need. It could be a family need. But if nothing else, we look at our nation. We look at our world. And we think, Lord, how in the world are we going to stand up as Christians against all the craziness and all the things that are going on? The good news is what? God has the final word. God will always be victorious we're willing to trust him. And he knows the way through the wilderness. He knows how he's going to work if we're willing to trust him. And so again, there's these three affirmations, these three declarations that we find in Psalm 46 that we want to look at today. The very first one is found in the first three verses. I will not fear because I have a refuge. I will not fear because I have a refuge. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the sea. Do you, do you believe that today? That you don't have to be afraid because God's your refuge and God's your strength. Whoever wrote this psalm knew exactly what it was like to be in trouble with absolutely no human way out. <coughs> It's interesting in the Hebrew, the whole thought of, of this is a tight place, a person that's cornered, that has absolutely no way out. It's not like there's other alternatives or other options. I mean, this person is just caught and, and, and sees no other choice. The earth is shaking, the sea is raging, the mountains are uprooted. And for ancient peoples, the mountain was the most secure thing that they could ever think of. I mean, who moves a mountain? <laughs> Certainly we can. And yet, what does it say? The mountains are shaking. And so again, it shows us the seriousness of the situation that this person was in. And so he had to make a choice. This person had to make a choice. We have to make a choice. When our mountains are moving, when our seas are, 
Are we going to trust the Lord? Are we going to keep our eyes on the Lord? Or are we, again, going to try to find some way out in our own strength, our own wisdom, our own understanding? And then the question comes in, Lord, have you forsaken us? Uh, yeah. And Hezekiah had asked that question, too. Because, Lord, why did you allow Sennacherib to come? Why, why, are, why are you putting us in this position? Are you still on our side? Do you still love us? Are we still your people? A crisis. Someone has said it this way. A crisis does not make a person. It reveals what you trust. It's what you trust in. So when you're going through a crisis, it's not to make you into something. It's to reveal something. What are you trusting in? It's interesting. An alcoholic does what? In a crisis, turns to the bottle. A drug addict, where they're in a crisis, what do they do? They turn to drugs. As a Christian, who do you turn to? What do you turn to? Do you trust the Lord? Do you turn to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what's going to happen in this situation, but I only have you to rely upon. You're the one that's going to bring me through. Can we do that? We do not have to fear. Why? Because we have a refuge. We have a God that loves us. We have a God that cares for us. And we don't have to be afraid. What's our problem so often as Christians? When we're going through a difficult time, what do we want the Lord to do? Lord, get me out of here. Lord, provide a way of escape. I don't like this. I don't want to stay here. You know, if you really love me, if you're really God, I'll think, you know, get me out. And the Lord says, wait a minute. Who's in control? Who's calling the shots? What are we going to do at that point? When God allows his plans and his purposes, John 10, 10 says the thief comes what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But what does Christ want to do? He wants to give us life and more abundantly. And so if we're going through a tough time, do you think maybe God has a plan and purpose in this? He's going to teach you something. He's going to grow you. Uh, I, I taught a Sunday school class recently on John 15, and that whole pruning process, because none of us are like pruning. <laughs> you know, and yet, you that are gardeners, you that understand all that, the importance of pruning, if you just let things go, you're, you're not going to have any fruit at all. It's only as you prune, and I'm sure when you're pruning the plants, they're going, what are you doing to us? Why are you doing this? This isn't, I like this. But again, So what's our refuge in the time of storm? What's our refuge in a difficult time? It's a fearless trust in God. That doesn't mean humanly you're not afraid. You know, we not like being this super person that, oh, I have all this. No, it's just saying, God, I'm scared to death. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how, but I trust you. I know you're with me, and I know you're going to bring me through. There's a twofold meaning for the word refuge here, and I think that's what we have to understand. The first one is, is the, a refuge is a place to hide. And there's nothing wrong with that. Turn to Psalm chapter 9. In Psalm chapter 9. In Psalm chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. It says this way. It says, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For the Lord, you have not forsaken those who seek you. And there are those times when the God becomes a safe place for us. He becomes a refuge for us. As I thought about this, I thought, look, what happened with David? David had been anointed king of Israel. He was going to be the next king of Israel. And so, but it didn't happen for 12 years, at least. And, and, and all of a sudden, King Saul's chasing him. King Saul wants to kill him. And so for at least 12 years, David had to run from King Saul. God had to be a refuge for him. David had to hide. He had to trust that the Lord would take care of him, would keep him safe. And so for, for those years, God became a refuge for David and kept him safe and worked in his life. Psalm 91, you know, they, you know the whole thing of sheltering under the, the shadow of his wings. And so God knows when you need a, a safe place. God knows how to do that, how to give you peace in the midst of the storm, how to, 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 to take care of you. But a second understanding of the word refuge is, is kind of an interesting one that we don't always think about, that we need to understand. 
to, to have a, a place of refuge is to be able to take the time to become strengthened to go back into battle. It's a time to kind of pause and, and allow the Lord to do his work in your life, in your thoughts, in your, in, in your, in your situation, so that you, not that you hide, but that you're able to go back into battle. That you're able to go back, to go back in and, and fight the situation. In Psalm 62, it's interesting, in Psalm 62, uh, verses, uh, uh, there's, there's three verses here. Psalm 62, verse 2, it says, uh, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. What? I shall not be greatly moved. And so again, God gives you that strength to stand in the midst of a situation that goes far beyond your human work. And then you look at, at, at verse 6. It says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And so again, that strength to stand and fight as a good soldier and able to, to, to stand against the enemy. And then you look at verse 8. It says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And so when you put those three verses together, it's interesting because in verse 8 it says, it's okay to pour out your heart to God. It's okay to say to God, God, I need you. God, I don't know what to do. God, I'm in a tight place. I'm in a, and, 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 and I need your you. And so what does God say? Okay, I'll be your defense. And I will, I like it, it's interesting in verse 2, it says, I will not be greatly moved. And then you get to verse uh, 6 and it says, I will not be moved. You know, in the beginning, you think, okay, Lord, I, I, I guess you're going to do it. And then you kind of, as the Lord's working, as the Lord's encouraging you, as the Lord's strengthening you, as he's showing you who he is, all of a sudden you get that fortitude that says, Satan, you're not going to win this battle. I'm going to stand strong. You, I mean, I'm only in, in God's strength and in God's grace and God's power and God's wisdom. And so again, as I thought about it again, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not I hope so, or I might be able to, or I can do most things. It says I can do. And I know sometimes <laughs> it's like, okay, Lord, you're sure stretching. You're sure stretching my faith. You're sure. But God says I can do all things. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 12, we have Paul's thorn in the flesh. And three times Paul says, Lord, I want out of here. I don't want this thorn anymore. It, it, it's hindering me. I don't, I don't like it. And what does God come to Paul and say? Paul, my strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. I'm not going to take this thorn from you. But my grace will be sufficient. My strength is going to be. And, uh, and, and Paul had to accept that. Paul couldn't keep arguing with the Lord. He couldn't keep saying, no, 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 that's not. No. Okay, Lord. I'm going to trust you for the rest of my life that your grace is going to be my strength and I'm going to be able to, to do it. Isaiah chapter 40, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll be able to run. They'll be able to walk. And then uh, in, in uh, Isaiah 43 says, when you go through the deep waters, what? I will be with you. God doesn't deliver us from the deep waters. He says, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. And that becomes a choice we have to make. Do I believe that? Will I trust the Lord? Will I let him continue to work in my heart of life? As I thought about it, I thought, you know, <laughs> some of the stories in the old, in the, you have the story of Elijah and Ahab. You know, uh, you know, you have Mount Carmel and, you know, the, all the prophets are killed. And all of a sudden, Jezebel says she's going to kill uh, Elijah. And he takes off running. <laughs> you know, he, he wanted a hiding place. And God says, okay, you'll get some rest. I'll give you some food. We'll get you. But then what does he do? He sends him back. He says, you go back. You know, you're, you're going to stand up against Ahab. You're going to stand up against Jezebel. And he was able to do that, not in his strength and power, but in God's strength and power. I thought of uh, Johnny Erickson Tommy. Many of you know her story, how she was, was, was paralyzed as, a, as a, a young teenage gal. You know, those first three years or so, all she wanted was God to heal her. I mean, she <coughs> begged God, and she pleaded with God, and she went everywhere she could. And 
She heard of anybody that had a healing ministry or anybody that was praying for the sick or whatever. And, and people around her also said, Johnny, we're praying that God's going to heal you. You're going to be back on your feet again and all. But it's interesting when you read her testimony where she comes to that point where she accepts the fact that God's not going to heal her. That God has another plan and purpose for her life. And God's going to give her the strength and the grace. And look what she's accomplished in all of her years sitting in a wheelchair. <laughs> I read something really interesting in a, in a, uh, that um, somebody asked her about her wheelchair and about going to heaven and all. And she says, I hope I can take my wheelchair to heaven. And they said, why would you want to take your wheelchair to heaven? She says, because when I get to heaven, she says, I'm going to stand whole and strong and, and I'm going to see how God used that wheelchair to make me who I am. And then you can throw it into hell. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that whole point again. What she saw was so negative. God says, no, trust me. And I will use it. And you will be a blessing. And you will be able to minister in ways that you never would. And she herself gives testimony. She said, if God had probably healed her as a young person, she says, who knows how many marriages she would have been into, how much shopping she would have done, and her life probably would have been useless. Because again, she was she knew she probably would have been a self-centered person who did her own thing and kind of, okay, thanks God, but now take off and do her own. It's interesting because uh, uh, Billy Graham's daughter, uh, Anne Graham Lotz, had the testimony she got cancer. And again, when you read her testimony, again, she said, Lord, I don't want cancer. I, I would never have asked for cancer. But she says, how are you going to use this cancer for, for in your kingdom? And it's interesting, our district superintendent in, in, in the district that I just uh, retired from, uh, she had she got cancer about, what, eight years ago? And, and, and she's almost died twice. She almost died with the cancer, and then she almost died with COVID and all. But it's really interesting to hear Elaine Miller's testimony. And, and she says the same thing. As soon as she found out she had cancer, her first thought was, okay, Lord, what are you going to do with this? How am I going to be a witness? How am I going to be a testimony? And when you hear, I mean, and it, she, she's just constantly talking when she goes for her treatments or whatever. She's talking to people around about, you know, again, she, yes, it's not easy. And yes, she would choose not to have it. But God, if this is your plans and purpose for my life, then help me to use it for your kingdom. And how God gives a refuge, how he becomes that refuge. How do we trust God? How do we believe that? There's three things. First of all, who is the refuge? <laughs> it's, not a per it's not a place. It's not a thing. It's God. What do you know about God? See, that's our problem. We don't know enough about who God is. And that's where we need to say, Lord, open your word to me. Help me to see who you are. Is he my father? What kind of a father is he? He loves us. He cares about us. He's always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He has all power. He will do whatever. And that's the kind of God. What are his attributes? What's his character? What are his promises to us? The second thing we have to realize is God's strength and God's power. God's provided us armor. What does Ephesians chapter 6 say? Stand strong in the armor that he, we can put on every day. Every day we can put on, that we can stand up against the enemy. We can stand against those fiery darts that the enemy is trying to send our way of fear and anxiety and unbelief and all those things. Romans chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? I don't care what's going on, Paul says, naked, perils, whatever it is. There's nothing that can separate us from God's love. You know, you read stories of, of, the, of, the, of the early martyrs and all. How in the world did they do that? Through God's grace, through God's strength, through God's power. And then it says that he's an ever-present help. And I like that in, in, in 46 verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And that whole thing about ever-present in, in the Hebrew means immediate, easily found. We don't have to go looking for God. We don't have to go say, God, where are you? Please, please, I need you. Where are you? Please come. God says, no, I'm already there. I'm already here. I'm with you. I'm right beside you. And all you have to do is call out to me. He's inclining his ear to us when we open and, and cry out. He's easily found. <clears throat> Hebrews 
Hebrews chapter 13 says it this way. Hebrews chapter 13. It says, so we say boldly, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And, and, and you know, it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So again, we have those promises that he's given to us, and he's always there, always with us, always watching out. What's Psalm 23? You know, everybody knows the 23rd Psalm. It's great to know it, be able to say it, but do you believe it? That he's your shepherd. That he leads you beside us. That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will not fear. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they're with me. And even if the very worst happens to us, where are we going? We're going home. We're going to be with the Lord. And everything that we've struggled with, all the things that have been so bad, so negative, are going to be gone. They're going to be gone forever. And that's the good news. Someone says it this way. God doesn't stop the bad things from happening. And that has never been part of his promise to us. God has never promised an easy life. What did Jesus say? You know, uh, I, uh, uh, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But, you know, don't be surprised about, you know, we're just passing through. We have an enemy. We have a, we're in a spiritual battle. But, so God's never promised an easy life. The promise is what? I am with you. I am with you now until the end of time. And that's the promise. And that's what we hold on to. That's our hope. So the first point, I will not fear. Why? Because I have a refuge. And who's my refuge? God. And who is God? The one that's always with me. Provides all that I need to, to, to be victorious. The second thing, it says, I will not faint because I have a river. I will not faint because I have a river. Jerusalem was one of the few ancient capital cities that was not built beside a river. Rome was built beside the Tiber, the Tiber River. Babylon, Babylon was built beside the Euphrates River. Cairo, Egypt is built along the Nile River. Why was a river so important? Of course, for a source of water. And especially in times of battle. If you were being attacked and you had to go into a siege, what would you need the most? Water. And so, therefore, it was really important that you had a source of water that you... So, because some of these sieges on these cities when they were in, in battle would sometimes be three, four, five years that they would, they would encircle the city and starve them out. Jerusalem was not built by a river. It was built in the mountains. And so, uh, Sennacherib, he knew that. He knew that. But what Sennacherib didn't know was that Hezekiah very wisely, early in his, 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 uh, his reign, realized their vulnerability. And so Hezekiah, there were, there were streams and there were, there were, mount, there were uh, 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 watering places around Jerusalem. So what he did is he directed the water into aqueducts and they came in under the city. And so there was water. There was a supply of water that came in that you couldn't see, but it, it, unless you knew they were there. And so therefore, they were able to, to survive. Even, uh, even though they were under siege at that point. Hezekiah had wisely built an underground system. My friends, what's our river as a Christian? What's our source of water? What's our source of supply? What can Satan not do to us? My friends, who's our river? God. God is our river. He's the one that supplies in the midst of everything that's going on. He is with us, and we can trust him. We have all we need. It's interesting, again, uh, uh, Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You have uh, John chapter 7, it says, out of our innermost beings, the Holy Spirit becomes that river of water that, that, that never runs dry. 1 Peter 5, 7, we can cast all of our cares upon him because he cares. Let me show you some verses of scripture. Uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah chapter 2. 
All three parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all designated as water, as rivers that we can draw upon and rely upon. Okay, so in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, Jeremiah 2, 13, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, what? The fountain of living water, and hewing themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What it's saying is, if you're trusting in yourself, you're a broken system. Yeah, you may have a little bit of water coming in, but what's happening to the water is going back out again. But if you're trusting God, he's a constant source. He's a constant source of living water uh, in, in your life. <clears throat> in chapter 17 of, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, verse 13, uh, he says it this way. It says, uh, uh, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Are you relying upon your fountain today? Are you re relying upon your source of, of, of hope and help and resources, all those kinds of things? You turn to Zechariah. It's one of those hard books to find. It's one of those minor prophets that are stuck in there. But yeah, right before the, 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 the Malachi, you, you find in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. This is talking about Jesus. It says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. What did Jesus come to do? He provides salvation. He provides forgiveness for us. He becomes that cleansing water that, that heals us, that restores us, that brings us back into fellowship uh, uh, with God. And so we have that. Uh, in John chapter 4, John chapter 4, Jesus, Jesus says it uh, uh, this way about himself. Let me find it here. John chapter 4, verse 14. John 4, 14, it says, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the waters that are uh, that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So again, he just doesn't give us a little bit. He doesn't give us just the bare minimum. It says it literally becomes a spring of that, that's constantly flowing, constantly available to us, constantly working in our hearts and lives. And so that water. And then of course the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, he talks about again the the the, the, the fountain that, that is open to us because of the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit who is going to be given to us. And so again, the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and lives, constantly providing for us again the water, the resources, the help, the strength, all those kinds of things uh, that we need. And we continue uh, looking at Psalm 46. And so who's the river? God. He's providing for us. In, in verse 4, it says, There is a river that what? Whose stream shall make glad the city of God. What does God give us? Joy. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Joy. It's not dependent upon circumstances. It doesn't depend upon how you're feeling. It doesn't depend upon what's going on in your life. Who's coming against you? Whether your finances are in order. Nothing, nothing wrong. And I know all those things cause us distress and at all. But what's the good news? He gives us joy that passes understanding. He gives us peace that passes understanding. All those things. So again, he'll give us joy even in the midst of, of, of even the most difficult uh, of situations. And, and then it says um, here in verse 5, it says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. What? Just at the break of dawn. And it's interesting because when armies fought, they usually fought at the break of dawn. That was the most logical thing, right at the beginning of the day when you know people were sleeping, just getting up and all that was a, a, a time to attack, sometimes by taking them by surprise. And so what does God say? Hey, he knows our limits. He knows how much we can take. He knows when he needs to step in and do something. And all of us can give testimony of that. Boy. If it hadn't been for the Lord, if God hadn't stepped in, if God hadn't worked at that point in my life or whatever, I, I don't know what would have happened. But again, God knows exactly when to step in, 
Winter Minister went to bring it that way. There's an interesting story about Hudson Taylor. It says the biography of J. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, records an incident that reveals his utter dependence on God. Taylor and one of his associates were opening the day's, day's mail, and each letter told of bad news. Uprisings threatened the safety of the workers, and everything seemed to be falling apart. Thinking Taylor would want to be alone, his associates started to leave the room. As he did, he heard a strange sound. Hudson Taylor was whistling his favorite tune, his favorite hymn. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of my loving heart. How can you whistle when our friends are in such great danger? My friend asked. Would you have me be anxious and troubled? That would not help them. It would certainly incapacitate me from my work. I just have to roll the burden onto the Lord. Casting all of our cares upon him. Taylor drank deeply the hidden spiritual river that gave him peace in the hour of testing. He did not think. Why? Because he had a river. Do you have that river? Are you aware of that river in your life today? The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Always available. Always provide if we call out to him and trust him. Let's go to the third point quickly. It says, I will not fret, for I have a revelation. In verse 8, these are, it says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolation in the earth, who makes war cease. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. First thing these verses say to us is come and see. Come and see. My friends, so often we, 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 we get defeated, we, the enemy overwhelms us and all because we forget. You know, we forget what God's already done for us, how God has already worked in our lives, how he's already delivered it and all. And, and so we get into a new situation and now suddenly we're, we're all, and, God, and, and, and the psalmist says, come and see. Don't forget. Look what God's already done. It says, come, behold the works of the Lord. That's why sometimes it's really important to keep a, a diary or keep a, a, a journal. That way you can go back and, and be reminded again of how God has worked and how God has blessed you. Or, or scriptures that have, have been meaningful to you. Maybe at the time they, they just stood out and, and you say, thank you, Lord, for that verse. But then somewhere along the line, that verse becomes your anchor. That verse becomes your life. That's what you hold on to when you're going through something difficult in your life. What, was, what, did, what would this say to Hezekiah? Hezekiah, don't forget that you got up one morning and there were 185,000 dead soldiers all around your city. Don't forget that. Next time you get caught in trouble or next time the enemies, don't forget 185,000 soldiers don't forget what God's already done for you. Don't forget how God has ministered to you. Don't forget what God's already done in your family. Don't forget how somewhere along the lines he provided finances that you had no idea how. Or he brought you through a situation that was beyond. Don't forget those things. That's what the enemy wants us to do, is to forget and then not trust God or blame God or whatever. It says, come and see, behold, Behold, and, and this word behold has an interesting thing. Is It's seeing with eyes of faith like a prophet. What did a prophet, what was the ministry of the prophet? To see beyond, to encourage people, hey, God's going to do this, that God has a plan, God has a purpose, and we may not understand it now, but again, and so we're to be like a prophet. Okay, Lord, I don't quite understand how this is all going to work out, but instead of worrying, being uptight, and, and, and being anxious, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe your word's going to be, be uh, 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 brought forth. It's interesting because, again, it's the opposite of fret. And the word fret in the Hebrew means to be hot, to be overheated, to be angry. And how often we find ourselves fretting. God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this? I don't like this, or whatever. That's human. That, that, that's our human response. But what's the answer to that? Psalm 37. 
which again we're more than familiar with. He says, do not fret. Three times he says, do not fret. In verse 1, uh, in, in, in verse 8, uh, uh, do not fret because of him who is evil. Verse 8, uh, do not fret. It only causes harm. So again, what are we supposed to do? We're to trust in the Lord. We're to delight in the Lord. We're to commit our way to the Lord. We're to rest in the Lord. If we're doing those four things, the enemy's not going to be able to get through to us. We're going to be standing strong in the Lord. Because again, we know God's going to work. God has your work. You are going to continue to work. And I can trust you for this latest thing that, that, that's coming. And then not only come and see, but this is the harder one. Be still. Be still. We've come to think of that idea in the sense of just lay back and chill and don't say anything, just kind of wait and kind of, that's not what it means. What it means is take your hands off the situation <coughs> and stop trying to do it yourself. Stop trying to tell me how to work. Stop, stop telling me what you think the answer is. Stop telling me what you think. It's be still and watch me work. Be still and trust me that I'm going to work this call out. And so it's not a private word of comfort, but it's sometimes a rebuke to us. You're anxious, you're upset, you're worried, all those things because you are trying to do it. You think you have to somehow work this out. Be still. Be still. Stop striving. Stop cease. Just, uh, and, and trust me. Hezekiah, when he got that letter from King Sennacherib, and, and he said, you know, sorry guys, you're, you're, you're toast. <laughs> I'm, I have 185 men. We're going to come down. We're going to wipe you out. What did Hezekiah do? He took the letter into the sanctuary, and he laid it before he said, I'm not going to try to figure this out. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do this. There's nothing I can do to stop this. But Lord, you can. Be still. And that's what Hezekiah did. And, and God worked the miracle in, in his behalf. Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah and says, Hezekiah, trust God. He's going to deliver. Trust him. You think of uh, Joshua at Jericho. There's no way Jericho, Joshua could, could uh, defeat the, 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 uh, uh, the city of Jericho. So what did he do? He said, okay, Lord, how do I do this? And God told him the stupidest thing. March around seven days and, you know, don't say anything, just be quiet. And on the last day, go around a few more times and then start yelling. <laughs> and I'm sure all those people following Joshua thinking, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done. What in the world are you... Yeah. What happened? God did a miracle. And so again, we don't know how God's going to work, but he's going to work. Someone says, uh, Tim Keller says this, uh, about, about Job, okay? Job never saw why he suffered. God never told Job why he suffered and had to go through all those things that he went through. But what happened? At the end of the book, Job saw out of it with a new understanding of who God is. God didn't explain himself. God doesn't have to explain himself. What we have to do is trust that he is God. And that's enough. Is that enough? That's the bottom line. Okay, in conclusion, to wrap all of this up, when, when difficulties come, when suffering comes, when things go bad, whatever may be happening, how do we respond? We can respond in fear and unbelief anxiety and worry and all those kinds of things where we can say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe that you're in control and that you're going to be all sufficient. You're going to bring me through. I will not fear. Why? Because I have refuge. Either he's going to hide me or he's going to strengthen me so that I can go keep, keep going. I'm not going to faint. Why? a source within me that's going to flow and is going to provide all that I need. I will not fret because I know who God is and I know how he's going to work. It's interesting because Martin Luther wrote 
his great hymn based on Psalm 46. On Psalm 46. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the God of God's own choosing. Dost ask what that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils be filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fail him. God has the final word. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abide. The spirit and the gifts are his through him who with us abideth. Let goods and kindred go, the mortal life also, the body they may kill. But God's truth abides still. His kingdom, that's what's forever. And that's the good news. I just want to give you one final little uh, thought. I, I found this one time, and I've used it a lot of times in a funeral, especially. But so often funerals are so difficult because you don't know why. You know, a person's been sick for a long time, they've suffered, or especially if it's a child or someone that, you know, an accident and all. You know. But it's this whole thing again, it's so easy to blame God. It's so easy to say, God, why? Why are you doing this? Well, whatever. Just listen to this, okay? So it's recently a friend shared this story about a colleague of, colleague of his who suffered for a time from serious depression. Matt was a popular professor who had great impact on the lives of many young people preparing for ministry. How could this be happening, and where was God? How did God allow depression? As he asked these hard questions, Matt suddenly sensed the quiet presence of God and this calm assurance, look at my eyes and not my hands. In that moment, he felt absolute confidence in the love of his father. He still didn't understand what God's hands were doing in his life, but he trusted the love that he saw in his father's eyes. And then he uses this illustration that his daughter had something wrong with her foot and needed to be corrected. And the only way they could do it was by taking it every day and, and, and moving it and all. And it caused her such pain. But he knew he had to do it if she was ever going to walk, if she was ever going to be okay. So every day, and, and, you know, and he finally realized that what she needed to do, every time he started twisting her foot and it started to hurt, he said, honey, look at my eyes, don't look at my hands. And that's the key. Are you looking at God's hands and saying, why are you doing this to me? I don't like this, what's happening? Or you're looking in his eyes. And even though it may hurt, you know he's doing it because he loves you and he has a plan and purpose. He's going to provide all you need to win. That's the good news. And that's what gets us through the tough times. Father, I thank you again for who you are. Thank you for your word. I thank you for how you encourage us, how you speak to us, Lord, how you remind us again that, Lord, as you have worked, you continue to work, and you will continue to work till the very moment that you take us home to be with you. And Father, I know the enemy is constantly bombarding us. He's constantly trying to, to get us off balance and, and to, to get us fearful and full of anxiety and whatever it may be. But Father, again, he's a defeated foe. And if we're willing to trust you, if we're willing to rely upon you and your resources and your character and, and, and what you have said to us and how you've promised, Father, we too can be victorious, even in the most difficult uh, of situations. Lord, we just praise and thank you again for the fact that you are a loving Father and as we look into your eyes, we see that love, and we know it's going to be okay. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.